Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cast Dice, the podcast that explores the great big wild world of tabletop gaming that exists today. It's been said once or twice, mainly on this podcast, that we are in the middle of a gaming renaissance. There are just too many good games that we can spend our hobby time and our hobby dollars on, and it can lead to a serious case of not knowing what to play next. And I guess that's the purpose of this podcast. It's to dig into the games that my guests and I enjoy playing, to talk about big industry events, and to talk to the people who create these games. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, I was out for a little while due to COVID, uh, but thankfully, um, I was contacted by some of my personal heroes uh, from earlier slash now in my life. And um, their contacting me is actually what kickstarted me to get more sleep and get past the ringing in my ears and to get back to recording. And I have to say thank you to them before I even introduce them because um, they because they contacted me about this episode. We are actually probably weeks earlier then I was planning to come back. When I do the introduction of this show, I talk about the games that my guests and I enjoy playing. I talk about big industry events, and I talk about the people who create these games. And today is a very incredibly special episode of Cast Dice because it is hitting all three of those and in an enormous way because... The guests we are talking to today are going to talk about history, important history for you and I. Now, yes, not necessarily world history, but no one can disagree that at the moment, geek chic is a thing. Nerd culture, game culture, um, geek culture is popular in the world that we know. We see Marvel movies you know, being some of the biggest grossing movies in the box office. Everywhere you go, you see anime, you see Dungeons and Dragons, you see Games Workshop stores. There is a proliferation of all of the things that I loved as a kid. Now that I'm creeping 50, it's it's mainstream. And the guests that I have on today are going to talk to us a little bit about how that came to be. Obviously, not the whole thing, but particularly for the gaming industry, it is really easy to think of the big, the greats of tabletop gaming and gaming in general. We think TSR, we think Dungeons and Dragons, but for tabletop gamers, whether you love them or hate them, you're going to talk about Games Workshop because they changed the industry as we know it. And they made tabletop gaming what it is today. And today I am joined by two friends, people who I'm lucky enough to consider friends, who can talk about their personal experiences in making Games Workshop what it is today. Now, one of those gentlemen has been on this show and on other shows on this podcast network countless times before. We are talking about the man behind Warlord Games, the one and only John Stollard. John, welcome back to the show, sir. Hi, Brad, and hello to everybody. It is always a pleasure to have you on, sir. I see you are freshly shaven and ready to go. Ready to go. Love it. And, of course, the other gentleman joining us today needs no introduction, but is getting one anyway. When I first met him, we talked at length about his purple Doc Martens, but that isn't why he's famous. He is very famous for being White Dwarf editor for 50 episodes or 50 issues between, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Robin, 1991 to 1995. It was 91 to 95 that I looked after uh, White Dwarf. And then in 95, I stepped into the studio manager's shoes. And there you finished out the 90s, which... I I finished in 2001, I ran that too. Exactly, which makes you sort of... that. I mean, if we think about the studio that is the creative arm of Games Workshop, that is, you were managing the output that we knew and loved as kids slash adults slash whoever else played the game 
through Games Workshop's quote unquote golden age. So you have some wonderful stories for us, I hope. <laughs> Managing is a loose sense of the word here, Brad. I was chief cat herder. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, <laughs> we have talked to Rick. I do know how this works. Um, now, early studio, and God, I, actually, I, I'll hold early studio, and let me jump back a step. You gentlemen are with us today because there is a book coming out. Talking Miniatures is a 500-page, two-volume tome that is digging into the history of what we're talking about today. It's oh. this thing. This is <laughs> these are the print these are the printer's proofs, Brad. This is not the final version, but the printer's proofs give you a sense of what this book is going to look like. Oh, that's amazing. Look at all those pictures and oh, I just want to read this. It's text. a trip down nostalgia land. It's a trip down down nostalgia. It was for John and I over the last five years that we've been working on this animal. Um, but we're hoping that for fans and enthusiasts of Games Workshop, it will just push their buttons. Exactly. Put- well, we're going to jump all over the place today. But John, can you start us out by talking about what, how, what is this process? How did it begin? And how did you guys get to creating Talking Miniatures as a historical text? It's a very good question. Um, Robin and I, as you know, we've known each other for many, many years from GW days. And uh, Robin, although technically retired, uh, I we use Robin for a lot of doing our training and counselling. He's uh, that's his previous life is in counselling people looking after ne'er do wells. And so uh, on occasion, uh, I say, Robin, could you come over and do a training session or uh, whatever it might be? And so we kind of kept together in that way and. Mm-hmm. We were in my garden five years ago now, as Robin reminds me. It always seems like two, but it is, in fact, five years ago. On a nice summer's day, and we made a cup of tea and had some biscuits, and we're talking the normal nonsense that uh, you you do with your mates about how hilarious a lot of the things were at Games Workshop in the old days and how mad that it all seems to have worked out okay uh, and and how well they're going today. And uh, after laughing a bit, we've said, you know, People wouldn't believe it, you know. And we said, well, no. Then none of us are getting any younger. And we thought, well, perhaps we should write it down. We could do a book. Yeah, great idea. And we sort of egged each other on. And uh, we thought, yeah, that'd be great. And um, so we drove over to, over to see Rick Priestley, who uh, is always a good place to start. So uh, we went to see the uh, a Priestley Meister. And uh, he was most entertaining, as always. You set him going, as you know, and he... He just keeps talking for Scotland, England, Ireland, and Wales. Um, yes. And Robin, being a techie, has his super recording machine. So we got it all on tape so he can deny nothing now. <laughs> and that's how we started. And then we then started looking around for other ne'er do wells. And it's not Mar- Robin and mine's book in a way, it's 17 other people who were there at the time sculptors, artists, uh, factory managers people actually who did did the real work. And so we tracked them down, including one from America, and uh, and interviewed them all over a series of months and through COVID, of course, which came in and rained on our parade. So that's partly why it's taken so long. And through interviewing them for various hours of interview and then um, at painful editing and typing up, we've got ourselves a marvellous book. Yeah. I mean, once you have that many people involved, it was never going to be a pamphlet, was it? It was never going to be. And the only other thing that I, w- I would say, and I think John's described the process beautifully, is that from day one, after that first conversation with Rick, what we realized when we went back and listened to those tapes and, and, and kind of what, what the hell did we get today? It was just amazing because we didn't have so much as an interview because we had a conversation. And that's kind of why the book ended up as called Talking Miniatures, because it was a conversation between three old mates. Now, lots of these people, Rick Priestley, Jervis Johnson, Andy Chambers, you know, they've been interviewed. And when they get interviewed, people are very deferential saying, Mr. Priestley, tell us your wisdom, even though Rick goes, you know, I'm just Rick. Yeah. 
but this wasn't an interview. It was there were conversations between three old mates, or so in the case of Rick, Tony Ackland, and, and both of us, four people who were all there at the same time, doing different jobs, different bits of the company, but with memories. And one recollection from one of us would spark a memory from another one, and that would then spark another memory. And so it's not they're not interviews, they're conversations. And that makes it a very different kind of book. And that is one of the things that I find so exciting about this particular text, because having spoken to Rick on this podcast many times um, and have him, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to consider Rick a friend and he does often speak candidly, but it's from his perspective. It's his, from his voice. Um, I heard you say on the Crown of Command podcast that the Dice Man book is the story of games, early games workshop, but from yeah. a different perspective. Um, yeah, and it Stephen is their story. It's Stephen Ian's story. Exactly. What I find most fascinating about this is that you have such a span of people who had different roles within the company as it grew into what we know today. I know that John was my boss as CEO of Games Workshop USA when I was there. And when my boss quit, I had to rather intimidatingly um, report to him with my sales numbers at the end of every day. As uh, as everyone said, he was the king of trade sales. And that was terrifying. Um, thanks, John. Uh, you're always very nice to me when I was standing there quaking in my Doc Martens. Uh, but yes, it was. Uh, but to have to have the experience of so many people from different parts of the business, I feel like you get a much more holistic view than has ever been offered before. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, or John might want to speak to this, but I mean, what's truthful, what is truth, what is truthful about this is that companies are made up of lots and lots of people doing different kinds of things. And although we tend to look back and we look at Games Workshop and the kind of studio was the rock and roll area, you know, with the kind of cool people, the Jez Murray, the John Blanche and Jez Goodwin and all the and Andy Chambers, all these cool people. That's not enough. It was not enough for Games Workshop. It's no good having great ideas unless you've got fantastic people who can then get those out and sell them and people who can make them and work in factories and manufacture them efficiently and cost effectively. And then John's teams of guys, either trade sales on the phone or the or the guys and gals out in retail, running hobby centers, meeting young kids, getting them to play their first game of 40K or Warhammer. That is, it's, it's, you can't say, well, this is more important than that. It's all important. And we wanted to capture that in the book. We wanted to get a range of voices from across the business. That's what we were really shooting for. And I think that's what we've got. You know, that's really has what we've got. And again, you know, these are conversations with the people who were there in the trenches at the time doing shit. That's what was going on. Now, John, I know from speaking to Rick that some of the earliest games of 40K in their design phase were played, I believe, on your living room floor um, as he was coming up with the original rules. Am I getting that right? Yes, it's faintly pathetic that we couldn't afford a war games table, isn't it? Uh, on Games Workshop wages, but that might explain quite a lot. No, uh, we did actually... Uh, play a lot of the games on the floor um um quite uncomfortable uh, but lots of space you were um, young because we we're all renting houses so all the houses were tiny as they are in england yeah. and um yeah they, they absolutely fought out on the living room floor mm -hmm. so does this book go back to those days or before i mean it would right because rick was a mail order troll to start with and then he worked his way up and yeah, so this... it covers it certainly covers the Citadel Miniatures days when Games Workshop was down in London and Citadel Miniatures, uh, and that was run by Steve and Ian, of course, famously. And Citadel Miniatures were based in Newark, run by Brian Ansel. Mm. So, uh, very much it's those days mm. because that's really where things started to change. Because many people forget or didn't realize in the first place the Games Workshop was literally a company that imported Dungeons and Dragons and Rune, Correct. RuneScape and- RuneQuest. Um, yep, RuneQuest, thank you. Um, to the UK. Games from Japan, to be fair. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, so Go and chess and drafts and stuff. 
Oh, really? yeah. Awesome. Um, and then from there, um, it, it wasn't till Citadel sort of took over that the, the focus of retail shops changed. Um, John, I know this was talked about on the Crown of Command, but I am fascinated by the story that originally it was one manager of one GW retail store, not as we know as retail now. It was a game store sort of holistically. And he did gr good numbers and that changed the way Games Workshop did business forever after. Yeah, uh, now I'll tell you the story of that. It's uh, I still talk to him. There's a lovely man called Ian Hensel, a tiny Geordie bloke from Newcastle on Tyne. And he was running one of these uh, these generic game shops, if you like, which sold a lot of Games Workshop stuff and uh, and some Citadel. But they were selling Dungeons and Dragons and Bunnies and Burrows and all manner of nonsense. Uh, Trivial Pursuit, um, Ouija boards, very handy, uh, water pistols, kites, all manner of nonsense. And uh, and he was always doing well. He was always active. And then we noticed um, how his takings were going up and shooting up and doubling. So I got on the phone and said, what are you doing? What, what's, what's the... He said, well, I'm selling more of these Citadel miniatures. I'm putting more and more out. Because Brian had got uh, the monthly release of miniatures where we were putting out dozens of models because they could convert them every day. You know, the Perry Twins or whoever, or Ali, would do conversions on us so they could get you know, two or three models out a day easily. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, it was difficult to be able to buy them all um, or, and or display them. And so when Brian came up with the blister pack idea, where you, as you know, now know the, the blister pack idea, uh, previously, all the models were sold in little drawers singly, so you couldn't see what you were buying. Mm -hmm. But by going to the blister packs, you could see the huge variety of models that there were. So what Ian was doing was putting out more and more wire racks uh, with another 100 different miniatures out there. So getting them out from under the counter and showing them. And uh, and he just kept adding to it. And so I went up to see it, and I thought this was quite phenomenal. And uh, um, And, of course... Most of you will know that uh, uh, making your own things gives you a better profit, of course, because you're in control of the means of production. And selling printed material from, let's say, America or Japan, um, your margins are tight because you've got to you know, buy it and a thing and blah, 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 and ship it and everything else. And it, we worked out that, you know, if we sold, you know, five five miniatures, we'd make far more profit than a, a big box of Dungeons and Dragons. So it came down to economics, partly. And uh, and so we pulled all the store managers together in a in, in a pub in Nottinghamshire, and I said to them, guys, here's the plan. Uh, here's the proposal. Um, the proposal is that we move our stores to be totally Games Workshop and Citadel miniatures. Now think about it carefully. As I think about what you've got, I mean, it's going to be a huge drop in sales to begin with, you know, and um, and so I. We need to be very bold to either do it or not do it. And to a man, they all stepped forward and said, yep, we see the sense in that. We'll do it. And I said, are you sure? This could all go horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and to a man, they just put up more and more and more miniature racks. And that was it. That was the big swap over. Uh, and um, much as we love Dungeons & Dragons, it's still a fantastic game. And we're mm -hmm. there, but for the grace of God, go all of us. And they got us into it. Uh, we decided to concentrate more on the Citadel miniatures because Brian, particularly Brian Ansel, was uh, saying, what on earth, why are people buying hundreds of orcs, literally buying every orc we make? How many orcs can you get in one dungeon? <laughs> and it was, what, what are they doing with all these miniatures? And I was running mail order with Rick at the time. And I'd say to Rick, well, what, what do you think? What are they doing with them all? He said, well, I just, I think in their heads, they're building armies for a, for, for a game that doesn't exist. You know, so uh, um, and that's what was happening, and uh, and so that's when Brian came up with the idea of of war of a massed combat fantasy set, of which Rick had already written one a few years ago with him and his mate Hal, a game called Reaper, uh, which I'm sure Rick's mentioned before to you. Mm -hmm. so that's how it came about, really. That's that, that's that was the move into retail, and from there to putting the painting tables in, and then the gaming tables, of course, as a source of recruiting people, because. Nowadays, um, playing with model soldiers uh, in most of the civilized world is a is a rite of passage for young lads and some girls. 
1976, it was weird. Oh, yeah. You knew what goblins were. It was weird. And you were the school geek if you did it uh-huh. and would suffer accordingly in, with your head down the toilet at school. And, mm-hmm. uh, and we've all been there. Uh, so uh, by opening those stores, Games Workshop was able to normalise the whole thing of rite of passage for youngsters. Yeah, exactly right. Absolutely. Now, Robin, you, as you said, you came in at 91. Um, hey, well, well, 89, uh, I joined the company. Uh, I saw an advert. Well, I'll, I'll run the two things. Can I just jump back a little bit on what you just said before? Because let's talk about that history of, of Sizzle Miniatures. Because Sizzle Miniatures was created as a joint venture between Brian Ansell, who already had a com- miniatures company called Asgard Miniatures that he'd set up in Nottingham, and uh, Stephen Ian, uh, Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. So it was a joint venture between Games Workshop and Brian Ansell, and they were they became joint directors in Sizzle Miniatures. But what I like to, you know, what we talk about in the book is how, the, if you like, this Midlands um, DNA infected the host of Games Workshop, because it wasn't just Brian Ansell in Newark and Nottingham, but before that, you know, Rick Priestley that you, we've already mentioned, and his, his mate Hal, Richard Halliwell, um, they're from Lincoln. And one of the on the front of this book, you can see there's a subtitle there that says how the Lincoln Model Railway and War Game Society changed the world. And you go, what the hell is the Lincoln Model Railway and War Game Society? Well, it was a model railway and war game society in the little town where these two boys, schoolboys, 14, 15 year old schoolboys lived. And on the top floor of this house, as Rick tells the story, there were all the model railways, the guys did railroading and building scenery and laying their tracks. And down below were the war gamers, and amongst those war gamers was Rick Priestley, Richard Halliwell, um, uh, Tony and uh, Anthony Epp, Anthony Epworth, um, a guy called Paul Ellsley, who also works at Citadel, who's sadly no longer. They went along, and they were doing Ancients and World War Two and all of that. That's where the war gaming. And in that point in the mid seventies, it was Rick and Hal said, "Lord of the Rings had just come out." in the UK as a single paperback and people were getting very excited. And so Rick and Hal wanted to play, play the Battle of Pelennor Fields and Battle of Five Armies. They wanted to do that stuff. And so they wrote Reaper. And when they were 17, they got in touch with Brian Ansell for the first time and said, oh, Mr. Ansell, do you know how to publish things? We're, we've written these rules, sir. And that's, and that's how Brian and Rick and Hal met. And, and that's that origin story of how that, that DNA from the Midlands mixed in with the London Stephen Ian Games Workshop. And if I, I like to say kind of infected the DNA because eventually Citadel became the big, the tail that started to wag the dog because of what John's saying about, you know, the, the profitability of making miniatures and the whole thing. And then 83 came Warhammer, and then 87 came 40K, and then the world was transformed. That was that. So that that's that kind of history story. The in t- my turn, I was I was a I was a youth worker. I, I I trained initially as a youth and community worker. I was running a youth centre in South East London with with fairly reprobate kids. Um, but I started using role playing games, D and D, and then Warhammer. And these kids whose attention span used to be able to measure it in tens of minutes. Um, would be painting models and playing these games for hours. It was just a breakthrough for me as, as, a, as a community worker, as a youth worker. And then I saw an advert in White Dwarf for editors, developers, and I went, well, I, I could probably do that. I've been gaming all my life. And so I applied for a job in end of 88. And just before then, I'd written a battle report because I played a battle report with these kids from the youth club and I sent it into White Dwarf and it got published. So I'd had some contact with the company and I applied for the job and I got it. And I started in March 89 as an editor developer. And I was in this room with, you know, Jervis Johnson and Rick Priestley and Nigel Stillman. And I was a little bit, ooh, I was a bit like rabbit in the headlines, a bit starstruck. And I was OK at it. But actually, within a few months of that, Tom Kirby, who was operations manager at the time, he said to me, you know, you're much better at organizing people than you are at doing this. I want you to start organizing the production floor initially. And then that led to White Dwarf and, and the rest, as they say, became my, st- my story at workshop. But that's that's that bit. That's, bit of the, that's that bit of the tale. So what was your question now that I've stopped rabbiting from? <laughs> oh, no, I, I just I wanted will, to I will turn to Ron. I will turn to Ron. So you have to stop me every now and again. Uh, we can talk for hours. I can do this. Um, uh, look, uh, having having spent time in the U.S. business with John, 
having gotten to know, and I only met you because of our good friend, Jeremy Vitar. If, if I hadn't met the U S studio guys, I never would have met the UK studio guys and the UK studio as, as a long-term white dwarf reader as a child. And then as a young man, um, you know, I went, I got hired through the grand tournament circuit. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Jeremy gave me a, an orc head pendant, um, and a joke award at uh, a grand tournament the year I was hired and declared me the biggest knob of the grand tournament, the most obnoxious, loudest, biggest jerk. I know surprise, right? Um, that you are going to have the most fun playing. Um, and then, and then I got hired. Um, but the studio was always, you, you guys were rock stars and, um, I can, I can totally just hearing what you were saying about being a little starstruck. Um, yeah. many of us still are, however, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that is an intimidating, um, it was an intimidating place. I understand to walk into because it it was a bit of a machine. Um, now I know you have talked about this before and we'll plow through it quickly, but the, I mean, people always talk about, Oh, I want to work in the studio, the studios where the magic happens. And it is, but it also reminded me of a newsroom in, you know, the 1970s where someone would yeah. come and go, all right, buddy, you got, you gotta give me 500 words before 5 PM go. Um, is that is that an accurate assessment? Because you guys were constantly under the pump because the the company was putting out so many great releases that didn't always have fluff uh, fluff text behind it and or rules, and you guys had to, as you were saying, it almost like the miniature production side of things was wagging the dog. Is that am I getting this right? Yeah, you're getting that right. I mean, you know, I, I joined in March '89. First job I, I had. The first, actually, the first three jobs I had in the studio. My first job was I was sitting at the desk and some uh, plastic skeletons were dropped on my desk. And uh, if I go back, I can't remember which issue of White Dwarf it is. It'll be about 107. And I had some, they said, okay, we need some color text for that. And we need the rules uh, setting out. Uh, and it's a piece called Storm Riders. And it was uh, that I did for White Dwarf. And it's like, there's the miniatures. We need this by two o'clock this afternoon because we've got to get into White Dwarf. And then we're hitting deadline at the end of the day. So get it done. Uh, I was then asked to go through all of the issues of White Dwarf up to that point, pull out every 40K article. And that was put together in a book called the 40K Compendium. Now, the 40K Compendium was the first product I did for workshop. And that was by going through just photocopying White Dwarf, sticking them all in a folder and saying, yeah, we can use that and use that and use that. There's a book. Make a book out of previous White Dwarf issues. And then the third thing they did straight after that was edit Mike McVeigh's first uh, Sit on Miniatures Painting Guide, which was right. actually given as a freebie away in White Dwarf called White Dwarf Presents the Sit on Miniatures Painting Guide. It was that kind of stuff. Get it done. Get it done now. We were all young men in a hobby, not just in the studio, but I mean, John's lads out in retail as well. We were, you know, we, it was get it done. But there's something, it's, I, I'm going to, it's creativity and commerce, and they have to collide. Correct. Because creativity without the commerce is just people sitting in their bedrooms or at home coming up with cool ideas. What's the point in that? And actually commerce without something substantial and real behind it is just selling shit. Exactly. And that was exactly. that was very, very much uh, Brian's genius. I mean, Steve and Ian were fantastic businessmen, don't get me wrong. But Brian um, very cleverly kept the studio at a long arm's length from anywhere else. He yeah. isolated it deliberately to keep the genius guys at their desks and not to be infected by the nasty salesman who would demand everything <laughs> on a stick by next week. Um, and uh, and so, uh, again, um, Brian breathed into all of us two things, uh, quality of product and then fantastic customer service. So as Robin's alluding to, you have the most beautiful miniatures. You can sculpt them all beautifully. But if you haven't got a route to market, then you've got nothing or very little, mm -hmm. um, but by giving fantastic customer service, Brian forged the two together to make, you know, to make Games Workshop what it is today. And uh, um, um, a good example of that, no, it's no, no examples needed from the studio because it speaks for itself. But uh, uh, in 1980, I can assure you, probably anywhere around the world, if you wrote off for a, a set of miniatures or anything, in fact, 
uh, from a magazine who would say, please allow 28 days for delivery. That's what I would always say, because mm. the world wasn't set up like Amazon is now. You know, now we you wish it and it's there in three hours if you want it. But in those days, mm. pre-internet, you'd easily wait 28 days. And you think that's quite reasonable. Nowadays, it's madness. But Brian would always say, well, hang on, get, you get an order in on a Monday. If you're lucky, you could get it out Monday afternoon in the post, on the same post on the same day. Certainly by the end of Tuesday, it would be in the post. So it would be back in your in, in the customer's hands within two days, um, which was unheard of, unrivaled by any company in Britain, no matter who you were, Harrods, um, you know, uh, uh, Marks and Spencers. Nobody would do that. But Brian could just see it, and he did it. And that's uh, so a great product has to be sold really well. And backed up by customer service, and that customer service, what again, you know, is is Games Workshop because it was creating the stuff and then manufacturing the stuff and then moving it to retail and moving it to trade. It, you know, in kind of business speak, we say it owned the value chain. Um, but there was something much more fundamental than that: is that the customer service principles applied completely internally to Games Workshop. So, who who are the customers of the studio? It was the factory. If we didn't get our act together and get stuff on time, these guys were running like, around like blue eyes flies trying to get it manufactured and made. You know, who, who were the customers of the writers and the heavy metal team? White Dwarf was a customer. Mm -hmm. I said, I need those miniatures by this date and I need that text from you, Bill King, Andy Chambers, or, by this date. And actually that relationship where we trusted each other. And if you did screw up, you put your hand up and say, look, I'm really sorry, I screwed up. I'll get it fixed now and will get us back on track so that whole customer service experience if you like wasn't just at the front end where the the customers who paid money for this stuff was we we had that inside the company as well we trusted each other as customer suppliers i was one of john matthew's spiv boys um as in <laughs> i was part of the trade sales team of the us and um i was uh actually brought in as the first generation or one of them um, of the team that followed up the million dollar team with the customer service team. And so yeah. I was part of the customer service focus that John was yeah. part of the unrolling out of in the US, um, if that's English. And um, I learned a very, very, within the first day, I learned the term, take the knee. You do something yeah. wrong, you know, let us know what you did and we can help you with it. And Put it your was, hand up. be humble, shoot for the stars, do the best you can, but be humble. And um, if you make a mistake, let us know and we can help you. And we can fix it. Yeah. And that was um, literally a philosophy I've taken with me my whole life since. But yeah, yeah. And it was, it, it was in the DNA. And it was, again, coming back to John's point, a lot of this comes from Brian. Uh, you know, it, it, those that fantastic product and i mentioned to when we were talking to josh the other day you know the product had to be kind of spiky angular awkward difficult hard it was it had all of that kind of 70s uk punk rock sex pistols yeah. class shit about it. <laughs> all of that was going this isn't comfortable easy listening it was meant to be difficult and hard and awkward you know think of uh, lost in the damned and slaves to darkness oh you know, yeah we're in that zone but this again the spiky product isn't isn't enough you've got to actually back that up with genius customer service the kind of customer service that was delivered across the business well let's talk about something that games workshop isn't often given credit for that i think really did change the way the gaming industry operated and john maybe this is something that you can talk about um games workshop put out the 52 weeks a year, we have new releases. So as a trade salesman, when I spoke to shops, every Monday morning, I could call up and say, I have new exciting stuff for you and your customers. Mm -hmm. And it was never a, hey, I'm here to take your order. It was always, hey, let me tell you what I got. This is good stuff. Let's talk about this. And it has turned the entire industry over time into the expectation of, Where's the new hotness? And people want constant updates. They want constant releases. They want, when you have a, a miniature range as wide spanning as 40K, people aren't happy if a year goes by and they don't get a new release for their army. 
they want that constant update. And that has, I mean, that sort of follows into what you were saying before that we don't have to wait for anything anymore. That really did change the way that we expect releases in the gaming world. That is a huge difference. Um, John, w where did that come from? Oh, it'd be Brian again. Um, Brian um, uh, would set the pace and then it'd be down to the salesman. It would probably me then. But uh, 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 after getting my marching orders from Brian, it mm -hmm. would be causing constant excitement to the trade and the retail stores out there. So, as you say, regular releases every single week of the year, there'd be something, whether it's a, a new box set would be nice, um, uh, but certainly always some blister packs of something. Um, so, as a salesman, it always gave you a great opening. Hello, madam. Hello, sir. I've got something new for you. So, you know, so it's a very good intro, you know. Oh, right. What do you got? And it could be something. I mean, it, imagine our excitement when those first space plastic space marines came out rtb01 30 <laughs> space marines plastic sprues and the joy of phoning up customers saying i've got something you're not going to believe is coming out and uh we just couldn't keep those in stock for instance and uh um but um it would then be as a salesman you'd be i've got some new high elf models uh they're quite nice models um uh would you like some of those yes that gives you the in then your next statement would always be how many Space Marine box sets have you got left in stock? <laughs> and the answer almost always was none. <laughs> yes. yeah. But as the as the ranges grew, it was it's it's difficult to keep up trying to because then people say you haven't had any dwarves out for six months. So I'd moan at Rick or whoever, or oh, I'm not any dwarves. They go, Well, we're gonna redo the dwarves, don't worry. We've we've got this cannon we haven't released though. We could let's put that out. Oh, that'd be great. That would just really keep the wolf from the door you know and uh, and keep mm -hmm. it going um but yeah constant excitement um and an assortment is what was needed and and then you yeah then you get some really big hitters like uh, the plastic skeletons which robin mentioned i mean they were yeah. they were just wonderful um mm -hmm. uh, that was when games games workshop was trying to find its feet with plastic miniatures mm -hmm. now they do almost nothing but wonderful plastic miniatures. Just, just you know, they're spoiled for it. But uh, you know, in 1982, uh, we didn't have anything really. You know, or you know, very we had the plastic, drastic plastic orcs and the uh, uh, psycho styrene dwarves, which were of their day, shall we say? Uh, classics. And the real is how you refer to them, John. Classics. <laughs> That's it. That's right. Classics rather than ropey old, ropey old tat, but <laughs> yeah, or ropey old tat, as I would call them. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you could see what they were trying to do. We just didn't have the technology or, or the funds to do it all. You know, plastic injection molding is so expensive, yeah. and um, you know, and we we all had to fund it somehow. So, uh, but making yet more metal miniatures and doing more and more conversions was the way forward. And you mentioned the um, the busy newsroom. I, I think it's the, I use the same analogy because suddenly you had to, you had to get this magazine out or uh, whatever it might be. It even got to the stage sometimes that uh, the miniatures that you see in White Dwarf or on the cover aren't even painted on the back. They've just painted the front because we didn't have time to paint no. everything because you have to make do and mend, don't you? And mm -hmm. that's what happens when you get on the treadmill. Um, it causes great excitement, but occasionally you have to cut some corners to, to get where you want to be. The other thing I'd say about that as well, Brad, is, is you know, w there were so many releases coming out, but they weren't all equal. All releases aren't equal. And then we kind of categorize those releases. So so um, what were the hot releases? Well, actually, the kind of, if you like, a tier three release was a, a remake of an old model. It was a better one. It was a nicer one but it was a remake of something that was already in the range and we'd hope people would buy those. Then the, a tier two release would be um, models that existed in the lists, but didn't exist in, in, in the game. And, mm -hmm. and in the game, that was where people, you know, having to do their own conversions or make do, or, you know, this will substitute this. And so that was kind of a tier two release. That was really exciting. Tier one releases were new models with new rules because new models with new rules bent the game system. They, right. they created a distortion field and they, whether you're a 40K player or a Warhammer player, something new, 
you've never seen this before with rules for using it on the table. That was top draw. That was that they were the number one releases. And we were aware of that. You know, this is when this isn't retro making it up. We're kind of how do we mix and match that? How do we not, you know, of course, the salesman was like new models with new rules all the time, every time, because that's the sexy shit. But we kind of go, you can't do that. We can't we can't just do that because you blow everything in one go. And that's what a Warhammer or a 40K, because, you know, we at that time we had what was called the two year, four year rolling cycle. Mm -hmm. So we would do a new edition of Warhammer or 40K every four years. Why four years? Because we kind of judge that young lads, largely young lads, but girls as well, of 13 or 14, would get that Warhammer or 40K when they were at that age. And then four years later, and they're 18, 19, and they've suddenly discovered sex, drugs, and rock and roll and all the rest of it. That I probably can't say on the podcast, but that, that, had, that had happened. And actually then their younger kid brothers wanted their own thing. Mm -hmm. And by jumping Warhammer and 40k two years apart, we kept that two-year, four-year rolling cycle moving all the way through the all the way through the 90s. And that's what we were doing. And, and people kind of went, oh, it's gonna be a new 40k next year, isn't it? I won't buy this. <laughs> and that came, that created problems with the end of product cycles because mm -hmm. people would start to anticipate the new one coming and we'd see a sales in you know, all of that stuff. But that's again is is how how creativity and commerce have to work hand in glove you can't have one without the other you've got to work both and and that's why games workshop was genius then and is utter genius today is because it it manages those two powerful elements um, exactly exactly and to go back to something you said earlier i mean you were talking about or maybe this was prior to our oh god this is before i hit record i'm sorry i'm that guy um, you were talking about uh, marvel back in the day and being able to, as you and I are both big Marvel fans. Yeah. Um, but back in the day, you could only get Marvel comics in certain places and in the UK because it was mass distributed and you didn't know where issues were going to end up. No. And so you kind of had to go on a bit of a hunt to find things. And if you were lucky, you'd get the issues you wanted. But Marvel sort of in the 70s and 80s, and as someone who read in the 80s, and early 90s, I totally understand this, what you're saying here, is basically everything that we're seeing in the Marvel Universe today, in on the big screen, on the little screen, on in comic books, they're just, you know, farming exactly what the same land that they planted way back when. And for those of us who haven't played 40k in 10 years, um, and yet walk by the GW store every now and then to look in the window and buy paint. Like, are those gene stealers? Is yeah. are those squats? And to look at the old become new again. Is, yeah. It feels as though GW is doing the same thing. I, I, I don't know whether it's a I mean, it, I'm not a historian of the gaming industry, but what exactly that's exactly what we said. I think because I was a Marvel head when I was a young kid, 11, 12, with my brother, we were both collectors and or just comic book fans and so as i was saying to you earlier you know when when we went on holiday with my mum and dad because distribution was random a container i guess would come over to the uk and they'd just be scattergunned across the uk there were no organized comic store sh a comic shop didn't exist there were news agents that sold newspapers and candy and 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 marvel mm -hmm. comics we would just go on holiday and we would just be hunting down every news agent to try and find can we find that issue or that issue that we're missing from the collection it was just so exciting it was so thrilling but in that decade say let's say 63 to 73 when was first spider-man 63 i think i've got an, i've got an issue number one in my collection somewhere um and that decade what's your address, they, they, yeah. <laughs> what's your address? Uh, yeah i might be getting the plane over I'm, and I'll be wearing a bar not, balaclava, but I'll not, I, I, I do have one next door. I'm not going to give you my address. Um, and I, I love it and cherish it. Um, but that decade, Marvel created everything. Yeah. Everything that it has lived on ever since. And, I, you know, I, I'm not taking anything from Games Workshop, but say that after the release of first Warhammer in 83, and that was the breakthrough, that was the breakthrough point. And then four years later, you know, the second edition came in 84, a year later, because, again, that was Brian's genius. He said, oh, we've sold all this. And we said, well, should we reprint it? And he went, no, let's do another edition. Do it again. Do it better. Make it sharper. Make it a better game. And then 87, 40K came along. 
And then after that, out of those universes flowed everything else, whether it's Mordheim or Necromunda or Battlefleet Gothic, you know, all these are universe setting games. But in that decade up until probably 96, 97, and the tail end was Necromunda, Gorka Morka, that those kind of man of war, those kind of games mm -hmm. of the old Castle Boulevard studio, absolutely everything that the Games Workshop has, has done ever since. Now, Games Workshop, modern Games Workshop is an, an amazing company. And I look at their products like Leviathan and the box set, mm -hmm. and you go, just wow. Right. And the fact that they're digging into all of those worlds again in really interesting ways. And Dungeon Bowl is back out there as well for mm -hmm. Blood Bowl. Uh, but and so they should, because they have a fantastic legacy of material that you, can, you can't you can exhaust it. How can you ever exhaust that material? Because you've got two universes to populate and explore. And, and that's, again, was the genius of Games Workshop back then and to this day, is if you own the universe, then you can do anything you want. It's true. Now, Robin, I have to ask, how did you feel about the announcement, what was it, last week of uh, the new hot? Epic 40K. Well, I got, I went, it, there's a lot in the book. There's a lot in the book. I mean, you, you're alluding to that. I was a huge Epic fan. I and remember. I could, tell, I could tell lots of stories about Epic. And actually, one of the stories that, you know, we talked about humility earlier. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, I, that Epic taught me is because as the manager of the studio, I really liked Epic. And I really loved what Jervis and Andy did with Epic 40K. And, but Epic 40K on release was not successful. And Andy and Jervis and I talk a lot about that in the book, both in Andy Chambers' conversation and in the Jervis Johnson, about why it wasn't successful. Because I thought that game system was just genius. I thought the blast markers, mm -hmm. which was a mechanic that Jervis and Andy came with that showed you where the hotspot was on the battle. It, it, if you were being shot at, then it affected your movement. It, it, they were just genius. And they re-emerged, Alessio Cavatori, put them into bolt action. You know, mm -hmm. That mechanic came back a decade or more later because it's such a brilliant mechanic. It's such a brilliant me right. mechanic for tabletop war games with the pin markers. The pin markers in, in bolt action and indeed Gates of Antares are the, are the blast markers from 40K. But I, I love that game so much. And I insisted that Andy and <laughs> Jervis put flyers into it. And oh, I, be I, I became least effective as a manager of the process when I got over involved in the game. And that's what mm -hmm. was a lesson for me as a, as a manager is let you, let you creative guys get on and do it. Don't, don't mess with it. Don't, don't let your own personal uh, fascinations and obsessions interrupt that creative process. And I learned a lot from that. And uh, I, I do I regret that? You can't regret stuff. I don't do regret in my life, but I learned from that. I learned from that. But I loved Epic 40K and I and I still love Epic 40K. It's the, I've still got a big Epic army um, because. Are, are you going to try the new one? I might have to. Mm. <laughs> I might yeah. have to. I might have I... to. That, that and Blood Bowl. If you mean yes. the. Uh, uh, the Love Pirates of Doom was my uh, Blood Bowl team. And if, if you remember Jer Jeremy and I, Vitoc, uh, Jeremy Vitoc and I used to play grudge matches of Blood Bowl whenever I came over to the US to do a product presentation. And we got to the point that if you broke one of the opponent's uh, models on the tabletop, you got to take it off and put it on the floor and crush it. We got very bloody and brutal in our Blood Bowl games. And so uh, I remember having some, one, a couple of my models stomped on by Jeremy Vitok. He was a cruel man. <laughs> Jeremy was such a nice guy. No, he wasn't. He was a thug and a bully. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. I tried to say nice things. <laughs> I love you, Jeremy. I love you, Jeremy. I love you, Jeremy, honestly. And I patched it back together and, and repainted it, and it was fine afterwards. But, you know, I'll never forgive you, you bastard. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Well, I, I feel like I'm now getting in the weeds because I'm asking about uh, particular um, pet projects. But John, I, I know that there are, uh, there's a lot in this book, or should I say books, and we've sort of skirted around some of the topics. But let's talk about what do you think are some of the main themes that people might look to this? Because as I said before, the Dice Man book exists, and it is the story uh, through other people's eyes. What are some things that 
um, people can look for in this book? Mm, what a great question, Brad. Um, 17 different chapters, 17 different takes on everything. Um, I would say Brian is mentioned, Brian Ansel, and his wife, Diane Ansel, would be mentioned by most of them for about quality and customer service and drive and vision. Um, one of my favorite chapters is written by, um, by a chap called Paul, who's the factory manager in, uh, in Eastwood. And it's a very, well, I, uh, very revealing chapter when I reread it, we interviewed him, but I've reread it recently. And, uh, it's a very humbling uh, view on, um, as Robin was referring to before, we had the uh, fuzzy felt department, the studio, making all the lovely stuff, uh, uh, all rock and roll and everything else. All great fun if you can get your job in there. Um, and uh, and then there's people who actually do the work, which is um, large men and women in Eastwood, which is an ex-mining town, which is basically mm -hmm. all the mines have been closed. So people had to find another job. And between everybody, um, uh, we got a magnificent factory and warehouse that, that could make beautiful miniatures, produce these wonderful miniatures. Because again, the sculptors, hugely talented, but you have to be able to make the molds work. So we got a chapter in there from Anthony Epworth, who's, who was the mold maker in the old days, oh. talking about how you make figures. And it's all very well, let's say the Perry twins making these marvelous figures in 3D, doing all manner of stuff. But if you've got your arm out like that and here, or wherever it is, you can't cast the bloody thing. No. So, um, so Paul's chapter on the Eastwood years, I think is great. He talks about hardworking people and how you, if you treated them right, they'd be the most wonderful, loyal employees. And he tops all with a marvelous story, which I won't ruin, of when the local, um, some local um, so-called thugs came into the factory to sort somebody out. <laughs> and Paul had to face them down in the factory um, and um, and got some very useful support. Uh, but uh, I'll leave that one thing, but it's very humbling. So, uh, uh, And the other thing would be all 17 of them would talk about how much fun they had and that they're pleased to have contributed to something which on one side is a daft hobby, you know, playing with goblins for God's sake. How mad is that? And yet so much pleasure has it brought. Um, um, Tish, for instance, uh, Trish Mor uh, Morrison, or, uh, sorry, not Morrison, uh, but she was then. Uh, yeah, but now no longer that. Uh, she just thinks she knows how much pleasure she's given people over the years and still is. She's still making models and, uh, and that's very humbling as well. And um, for me, uh, researching this book with John and, you know, going around and sitting and drinking tea with various people and, and having these conversations, what, what was utterly amazing is, you know, both of us worked for Games Workshop probably between us for 50 years. You know, I was there 24 years and John was there 30, 30 odd years, you know, 50 years. Yeah, the, stuff, yeah, the, really the stuff that we didn't know, the stuff that I'd never know. I'm, I'm just going to pick the pushes in front of the camera. We talked to Bob Naismith and there's a little picture here in front of the camera. If I can get it, it's probably, uh, we can get it. No, we can't. My fingers are on it. There. Look. That is, it. That is there. What is, what is there? There is a World War I US service Doughboy backpack, and it's got three nested compartments on the outside. And actually, we were talking to Bob, and Bob said, oh, oh hi. When I, was, when I was trying to design the Space Marine backpack, there it is. And there's a Space Marine backpack. You cut some up. Yeah, there it is, the three nested compartments. And Bob told me the story about how he got that design from, you know, he was historical because lots of these guys are historical miniature makers. And he put the, the bedroll that used to sit on top of that pack became the air vents on the ventilation system for the space marine. And that's, Bob told us that story. And John and I again, fucking hell, Bob, we've known you for decades. I've never heard that story before about how that came about. And elsewhere we've got, uh, I, I Maybe I could send you some pages that you could cut into this, Brad, rather than me trying to hold books in front of the camera. Um, in Tom, Tim Pollard's collection, he's got the original cardboard and uh, mock-ups for the Rhino designs that were, many people said, what should the Rhino look at? And he's got all of this stuff 
in there. So the book was full of things through each of these conversations, because they weren't just conversation. We went around to people's houses and sat and chat with them. We also got access to their personal collections. They were beautiful. They were wonderfully generous people. Mike McVeigh, we talked to via Zoom because we were in lockdown by then. Mike tells some really great stories. You know, one of his great stories, and it is in the book, is how um, when he was 18 years old, he got an interview at Games Workshop. And he went down and he was, you know, a young lad who just dropped out of university because he'd gone to do geology at university. He did two weeks at the university. And go, what the fuck? I don't want to be a geologist. What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. um, and so he got this interview and he went into John Blanche's office. And there's John Blanche sitting there in his full biker mode. You know, it was full kind mm -hmm. of late, mid 80s, long hair, beard, leathers, Harley parked outside. And um, on the shelf behind John was the classic Minotaur with the Mona Lisa banner sitting on the shelf just over John. So this guy's interviewing him, and Mike is sitting there going, ooh, just looking at this, looking at this model. And he did the interview, and he just thought, John must have thought I was some kind of nut job. And he walked out, and he didn't get the job. And actually, he sent me afterwards, he sent me a package of stuff. And one of the things he sent me was his rejection letter from John Blanche, which we've also printed in the book. They're saying, dear Mike, thanks for your interview, mate, but no thanks. We might have some freelance work for you in future and we'll be in touch, that kind of thing. And it, I had no idea. I mean, the book is full, page after page after page of all sorts of stuff, revelations, insights. And, I mean, and that's the stuff that we, we were allowed to print. I mean, the stuff that made it, that went hit the cutting room floor. Oh, no, no way can we mention that. So there are stories behind the stories, but that's what it is. And the whole book has been a journey, a joyful journey of discovery, certainly for me, and I know for John too, of reconnecting with these people after, in cases, I hadn't spoke to Mike McVeigh for 20 years. I mean, and, you know, it was just lovely to he see. Still Mike. He's still looked 14. Yeah, he used to look 18 back then. He now looks 22. Um, and, 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 you know, Mike and Andy and Andy Chambers, you know, Andy, Andy Chambers and I, were big World War II heads. Every Thursday night, he used to come around my house and we used to play micro armor games together. World yes, War II he said that. Yep, micro together every every Thursday night. And I would have I would have my Germans. He would have his Russians. <laughs> and actually, Andy and I have recently reconnected around that. We're now playing um, what's called to arms Gates of Hell Ostfront on <laughs> online together. Yes, because <laughs> it's such a cool World War II computer game, and that's mm -hmm. just that came back because Andy and I reconnected. Oh, we love playing Germans and Russians. Let's get back and do some of that. But we're doing it on. Uh, and we had the joy of interviewing the Perry twins, um, <laughs> who was like talking to a barrel, talking to a barrel of monkeys. So they finish <laughs> each other's sentences uh, before the elms even started. So yeah, exactly. By the time, by the time we're trying to use the tapes, and uh, our friend Helen Morley was trying to. To find out which what person was talking. She says, I've no idea which one's talking at the moment. So in the end, we just surrendered and to put it down as Perry speak. And I, I, yeah, at some point in that interview, it just says AP and MP, and there's one word because I've got no idea who's talking. It's just not, it's just, and, and, such fun. It's, it, this sounds like a kind of crazy thing to say, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. But for John and I, as you say, six years ago in the autumn, I think it's late summer 16, we were sitting in this garden saying, somebody should write this down. And John said, well, we better bloody do it then. And that turned into this journey, this journey and this labour of love. And it's a labour of love that we've put together over five years and 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 not only you know getting the words and then editing the words and making because you, you can't you broadcast conversations but you can still gonna have to cut out the ums and the ahs and all the rest of it so those conversations that were recorded then had to be edited and then I had we had to source images for those and from you know huge collection of products and and, and negotiate that that was all going to be uh, cool and good um and that we've done all of that and we've had access to people's personal collections and it's just been this long-term labor of love and of course you know, we want to sell some copies of some books, but actually, and we'll hopefully we'll make some money. But you know, John and I are old men now, and we're both reasonably come. We had we, we were grateful to Games Workshop. We had good long careers at Games Workshop. You know, we're we're if we've done something that people love and enjoy and they cherish and they go, God, that was just brilliant. Then our job is done. And yeah, if we make some money, that'd be great too. But you know. 
money's just things. Money's just, you know, right. stu- stu- stupid stuff. The real stuff in life is about family and love and friends and connections and hobbies and the stuff that makes you feel alive. And for me, and I know John producing and writing the book, particularly in the midst of COVID, which was pretty bloody miserable for most people around the world, kept me alive, kept me kept, kept us engaged and going and thrilled and go, God, look at that. This is brilliant. Let's do more of that. So I think that's one of the things I'd like people to kind of have the takeaway. We love this. We, I, This is the book I want to, you know, as a hobbyist, this is the book I would want to read. And I'm really proud that we, John, we've been able to make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, guys, we've hit the one hour mark and I have only scratched <laughs> the surface of my question. Is, is that all um, you got? Oh, oh no. I have plenty more. Um, do you have time? Uh, John, I know you're a vis- very busy man. Do you have a little bit more time for us today, sir? I, it's okay if you don't. I've got another 15 minutes. Okay. All right. All right, you've all got right. 15 minutes, Brad. Go for it. All right, let's go. Um, really quick, I know we have talked a little bit about this, Robin, off air um, when we were um, doing resolving some technical issues, but I want to dig into a model story, um, particularly you as a model story, um, because I happen to notice for those who are not seeing this on YouTube, there is a picture over Robin's shoulder of uh, some, one of my favorite images from Rogue Trader of some Space Marine scouts coming down the stairs. And uh, Robin pointed out that it's on his wall because he might be in it. Yeah, Dave Gallagher gifted this me, and Dave is a lovely man. Let me just get this. I'll try and get that off the wall and put that in front of the camera. So down there in the side there, there we go. It's me with a power axe over my, my shoulder. Mm-hmm. And Dave, I, I appeared in quite a number. There's another, there's a very another lovely Dave Gallagher piece. Um that's very yellow and red with flamer. And I'm a captain in the front of that. They're coming out of a Land Raider or a Rhino. It was another white wolf cover. And, and of course, you know, as a, as a slaphead, you look like a space marine captain, the, the shaved head and the hard look. So Dave would often use me as a model for that one. But the big deal was that back in the, that old studio, we're talking Enfield Chambers here, you know, way, way back in the day, we had a vacuum cleaner and the vacuum cleaner stood in for all sorts of power weapons in 40K. So Dave, when he was going to do an illustration, he would actually get um, a Polaroid camera. You know, we had no digital cameras, only film. Mm-hmm. Or Polaroids was the only way of getting an instant camera. You click and zzz, this thing would come out and it would develop in a couple of minutes. Arcane, I know. And so Dave would set people up. And so the vacuum cleaner stood in for all sorts of 40K weapons. So that power axe over my shoulder is the hose and the head of a vacuum, uh, is the arm and the head of a vacuum cleaner that's in that part. Do I wish I had the Polaroid now? God, do I wish I had the Polaroid now, but I don't. And of course, the hose, that crinkly hose you get on a vacuum cleaner stood in for melter guns and all sorts. It was just great. And that's what Dave would do. And actually, if you look at this picture, um this guy this guy right here is jess goodwin <laughs> that guy there the the picture appears in the book we reproduce it in the book and i talk a little bit about the vacuum cleaner in the really? book so if you want to see it rather than me holding a picture up in front of a camera um jess goodwin is just behind me coming down the stairs again because dave would say you're cool looking jess jess had kind of spiky hair had that slightly punk haircut at the time Mm -hmm. so you know jess is in there and i can't remember there's another guy as well who was one of the editors for warhammer books the first iteration of warhammer books but all of those tim pollard uh, is in so many different uh of john blanche's paintings particularly because john and john used to live around at tim's house and again it's uh, I'm, i'm trying to give you some flavor of all the stuff this these are the stories of the people who yeah. were around doing this kind of crazy shit back in the day. So I well, I have a lot of questions, but I'll boil them down to a couple. Um, I will I will give you a quick short one. Um, both of you were with the company, as you said, for, a, in, for an incredible amount of time. If you had to pick your favorite miniature from that time, any miniature at all, what miniature would it be? John? Um, it would be um, the extraordinary uh, techless model that came out when it was redone. It had been done, and then I think it was Jez 
mm -hmm. redid it, and at Teclos and Tyrion, um, mm -hmm. they set a new bar for miniatures for me. I was bowled over by it. It was yeah. just... And they're still lovely models now, and I'm sure he can do even better now. But it was extraordinary. So extraordinary was it that we thought we could actually charge five pounds for that model. It was so wonderful. We thought, well, you're only going to need to buy one, and and everybody will want it. And we even put for the to set it out from the rest from the, all the rest of the war acts. We actually put in some coloured foam behind it. We put red foam behind it to set it off and. Uh, it's sold like bilio, but it set a whole new standard for 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 the whole company. I think everybody was knocked out, so that would be my one. That is a great pick. Nobody has ever asked me that question before. Nobody really? ever uh, nobody's ever asked me that question before, and so I just had to kind of go. <laughs> and, and I'm going to come back and say, actually, the Wood Elf Dragon and Dragon Rider from mm -hmm. the the Wood Elf Army, because my big armies were. I had um, a big empire army before I even joined Games Workshop, and it was made up of all the old Perry's early medieval stuff before the empire got its Landschnecht uh, look from the Perry's. And I was really mm -hmm. into the humans in um, Warhammer. And actually, 40K, I had a Blood Angel Space Marine army as well, and an Imperial Guard in uh, Epic. I like playing humans. I was never much of a monster guy. And then <laughs> when the Wood Elves came out, and it must have been third edition maybe third fourth it must have it was the third edition warhammer i really i mean okay i'm going to go for a, a kind of monster army but it's not a monster army because it's the wood elves and I, I i was completely taken and this is going to sound so stupid that the wood elves had a vegetarian dragon and the rules for that dragon was that it was a vegetarian dragon i thought that's for me i'm going after that and it's just a beautiful trish model dragon mm -hmm. Beautiful dragon rider, and that was the centerpiece of my Wood Elf army. And I just like the idea of these eco warrior tree hugging lovies. That's the, the kind of tree hugging hippies that are the uh, you come into their woods and they'll fucking kill you. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's the, you damage our trees, buddy, and you're dead. That's the, we're gonna stick our vegetarian dragon on you, buddy. Yeah, we're gonna set yeah a vegetarian dragon on you. So it's, yeah, the Wood Elf dragon. That's my that's my one of my go to models. Awesome. Oh, that is also a very good choice. Um, gentlemen, I, I could not go past this. If we're talking the history of the golden age of Games Workshop, and this is a little in the early days, but there, for those who don't remember, Games Workshop Records, and I did promise I'd come back to this because I was asked to ask. You guys did put flexi discs in White Dwarf. Um, Robin, that may have been at the beginning of your tenure or right before. Before, um, before. Can someone Stop. mention something about Games Workshop Records and how that came to be? And is it in the book? It is in the book. Andy Jones was the 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 character, but I mean that again came from Brian because mm -hmm. Brian noticed that at our games days and our events, lots of the people coming along were metalheads because. <laughs> Heavy metal fans and Games Workshop fans overlapped. People mm -hmm. into, were metalheads back in the, you know, we are talking late 70s, early 80s, you know, first wave of heavy. This is probably on the edge of that second wave of heavy metal with Iron Maiden and Saxon and Judas Priest rather than the, what I call the Purple Zeppelin Sabbath first first wave of metal. Mm -hmm. But these guys, which is why Brian, Brian insisted we only ever did black T-shirts. We were not allowed to do white T-shirts. We only could only ever do black T-shirts. Because uh, so they would appeal to metal heads, and then, <laughs> and then, amazing. and then some kind of deal came out where uh, we got in touch. Sabbath uh, put the, the metal, and then we got in touch with, or Andy got in touch with. This is all Andy, and Andy tells the story. Uh, Bolt Throw got in touch, and Bolt Bolt Throw mm -hmm. were were a metal band who were into um, Warhammer, which is why they were mm -hmm. called Bolt Thrower. And so and the mighty they, Gua, and That's the mighty right. Gua. And then, and then somebody um, said, Brian probably said, Andy, we need a record company. We need a record label. Go and sort out a record label. And so uh, Andy went off and dutifully did that and, and, and did some stuff. And we did. And Andy talks about it in the book. He says, you know, D-Rock is his, was his high point of that. D-Rock yes. was just a good, solid metal stomp album. And this was by guys who were really into um warhammer 40k and the imagery they were into they're into the whole noise marine space marine thing then warhammer yeah, records kind of Marines. 
this started getting a bit weirder. We got another guy in the studio who is from the record industry or the metal industry. I can't, I can't Gary, somebody. And we started signing people like Rich Rags and, and Wraith. And, and you kind of go, are these guys really anything to do with us? Not really. They're just, they're just looking for a record label. They're just looking for exposure. They're trying to piggyback. And a lot of that stuff, when Brian sold the company around 1990, 1991 to Tom Kirby, or Tom Kirby led a management buyout. Tom had been operations manager. He joined workshop from TSR uh, originally. And Tom took over the company. And Tom had, a, Tom had a different agenda. Tom understood, absolutely understood, and it was his genius, that what had been a successful company in the UK, largely UK-based, could be global. That a kid was a kid was a kid anywhere around the world, and that if people love playing games with toy soldiers and painting miniatures in the UK, they would equally love it in Australia and Germany and France and Spain and Italy and Japan and China. This, this, this was a global, and that was Tom's genius. Uh, but Tom also realizes that we had to focus. And he said, we're going to focus on Warhammer. We're going to focus on 40K. All this other stuff, just shut it down. Get it off, get it off the table. And so Warhammer Records was shut down and some of the other stuff, bits and bobs, were shut down. The um, For a while, all the role play stuff went out to Flame Publications. So Graham Davis, Mike Brunton, and um, Tony Acklam were doing Flame, yeah. And then Wolfrook was licensed out to James Wallace. And so Tom said, clear the decks. The things that make the money here are Warhammer and 40K. And that's what you're going to focus on. And again, Richard Ellard, I think, talks quite a lot about Tom, about you know, Tom's genius in lots of, lots of different ways. What Tom did, Brian was obsessed with product and with quality. And Tom was a different kind of manager. And Tom said, I don't have to worry about the product. I've got Rick Priestley and John Blanche and Alan Merritt and these guys in the studio. They'll look after the product. They'll make sure it's great and angry and spiky. I'm going to focus my attention on thinking, how do we take this business and how do we go global yeah. with, with this offer? And make he took the first steps to what Games Workshop is today, this £3 billion pound exactly. cap market cap on the company. I mean, just hugely profitable, but still thrilling, exciting, dynamic company uh, that's been a joy to have. I've been around for part of my working life, you know, for goodness sake, without this, you know, I'd have had to have got a proper job. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got to that because literally my next question is what were, how was the, do you talk about the handover from Brian to Tom? Because having spoken to Rick, that really profoundly changed the, the scope and the, the vision of the company, as you just referenced, you, um, we, it sounds like you do in the book. We do a little bit, or Richard Ellard does a little bit, because again, as John said earlier in this conversation with you, um, Brad, um, this is the, these are the stories of the people that we talk to. Right. We didn't we didn't set any parameters. We said, "Come and talk to John and I. We'll provide tea and biscuits, and I'll record it, and and we'll have a conversation. Whatever you want to talk about, whatever takes you fancy." And some of these conversations veer around from left to right. There's no plan here because. As we said, somebody would say something that would spark a recollection, that would spark a new story, and and they 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 veer and zoom all over the place. Um, I say it's better but, covered in in uh, Ian Livingstone's book, really. It, I think it's been much better in Ian Livingstone's book. I think that's right. Ian Ian covers Ian's book is what I call top down. It's the view from the management from Steve and Ian about their experience down. Our book is bottom up. It's the yeah. guys who are at, and the gals who are actually doing the work on a daily basis doing the stuff and i've said this story um a couple of times but i'll say it again there's in terms of brian's customer service there's a fantastic moment at the end of helen morley's interview nobody will have heard of helen morley outside of the games workshop family but she was critical to the success of the early business and it was christmas eve and she was sitting in reception everyone else had gone down the pub the factory was empty and all the rest of it and she's sitting in reception brian walks past and helen looks up and he says oh there's nothing worse than waiting for a phone to ring and brian stopped and he looked her in the eye and said the thing that's worse is sitting there waiting for a phone to be answered and that was brian's customer service standard that we all learned from and we all took forward to us in our lives and our careers that's the truth there's nothing worse than phoning a company and waiting for that phone to be answered because you think do they give a fuck about Exactly. No more. <laughs> Do they give exactly. a fuck? 
so that's so that that's what that's about in terms of time frame we had to we had to choose a time frame and our yeah. time frame runs from the founding of citadel miniatures at millgate in newark and then it's moved to victoria street and then to eastwood its third home and then the establishment of the games workshop design studio at uh, enfield chambers and then it's move it moved i think in 91 to castle boulevard and it remained at castle boulevard until 97 so the book kind of finishes around that move because at that point the thing that brian predicted came to play so brian kept the studio separate from the from the factory and the operations and in 97 uh, Chris Prentice, who was the CEO, or Tom Kirby together, they moved everything to a centre in, Len in Lenton. And everything was united on one site. And actually, at that point, it, it started to become a different kind of business. And, a different, and quite rightly, companies can't sit in a, in a trench and say, this is where we are, this is what we do. Companies have to keep moving. Right. And it was quite right for Games Workshop to keep moving. The Games Workshop we have today is a consequence of those decisions and Tom's vision to do this and unite this and create other, you know, no criticism here. But actually, yeah. it's a bit like if you're reading a, a, a book about your favorite band, about kind of the Rolling Stones or Metallica or whatever, you want the rock and roll years. You're not interested in their stadium mm -hmm. tours. You want to know what it was like when they were sitting around a three bar fire, freezing to death in their little cold flat, working out the rift to satisfaction. That's what you're interested in. And so we're hoping that this kind of captures the rock and roll years of that early Games Workshop sizzle miniatures. Sorry, long answer, mate. <laughs> oh, that is a great answer. I have thousands of questions just from our conversation, not even hitting my list. And I know that we need to call it a day. Um, but I know that most of my questions will be covered in the Talking Miniatures book. Correct. John, can you talk to us about how people can get this? Because I'm literally logging off tonight and I'm buying it now because I just found out I can get a signed copy. So talk to us. Uh, Talking Miniatures website. What's the official title of it, Robin? Talkingminiatures.co.uk. But you'll find it with Talking Miniatures. Go on there. It will show you some bits and bobs, a little video of me and Robin, I'm afraid, but it will then say how to order one. Press this big button here, and it will take you through to how to order your copy. There you go. And um, I heard a dirty rumor that you guys would be signing copies. We'll be signing all the ones that uh, uh, up until when the, uh, the print run arrives, it's uh, being printed even as we sit here talking. Mm -hmm. And any order that comes in before then, we Robert and I will sign them. We absolutely will. We're committed to that. Because if people pre-order our book, then they're making a commitment to buy something they've not seen, just on the basis of reputation and, and story. And we're going to say thank you for that. We 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 don't think anyone's going to just be disappointed. I'm not disappointed. I want to buy a copy of this. My, my daughter was one of the first pre-orders when it went on sale. And I went, for goodness sake. But she was on the website like that. Oh, my dad's book. But she's she's grew up. I mean, when, mm -hmm. when she was four and five, she used to come to the studio on the weekend. And I'd get them to kind of uh, put their hands on the photocopy and do little kind of pictures of themselves. Because I was working on White Dwarf and they, I, mm -hmm. I was doing childcare at the same time. Shut up, old story. But go and buy the book. Go and buy the book on pre-order from um, talkingmentors.co.uk. It plugs you through to Warlord Games uh, Dispatch Service. They handle all the cash and all of that stuff. When it comes back from the printers, it will then go on Amazon. And it will still be on sale by Warlord, but we hopefully, we're not going to set sign anymore. The sign is a thank so, you for people. It is. We, we set up a little publishing company called, called Shaggy Dog Publishing. That is us, me and Robin. Okay, so it's not, there is not another company that is going to be uh, reaping the rewards of your hard work. You will be um, sinking the money into making sure that this story gets out to as many people as possible. Yes, yeah. Shaggy Dog Publishing was there because John and I thought, well, let's we're going to do it, so let's let's do it. But you know, being the being the kind of animals we are, we all think well, there must be some other interesting hobby projects around there that Shaggy Dog could take a look at. <laughs> but that's for another sure day. That's that's for another day. So yeah, well, all is... the shipping and handling will be handled by Warlord Games, but it's yeah. a Shaggy Dog publication. And speaking of customer service, handled by Warlord, it will be done right. So that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, gentlemen, speaking of um, 
a story for another day. Unfortunately, I think our time has come to an end. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. I hope that either or both and come back at some point and we can talk more because I'm sure there are a thousand stories that uh, people want to hear and I personally want to hear. But as always, John, I, I talk to you not often enough. It is always a pleasure, sir. Thank you for coming on. And uh, I look yes, forward sir. to talking to you on your own show soon. Um, it's getting to be that point where you come in and spoil all the goodies for the kids. So um, I hope <laughs> to have you on the Warlord cast soon. You know, you know, I always tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, for those listening, uh, I am smiling like uh, like a kid in a candy shop because uh, I have questions. But, John, we will talk. And, Robin, as I said, it has been God. Over 20 years. Over 20 years, bro. On but... you outside of Facebook. And it is a pleasure to speak to you, sir. Um, yeah, it's good to see you well, both of you. No, it's, and, no, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's been a blast. I mean, you know, what, you know, you ask us a question and we'll talk for England just because we love this shit. We just exactly. do. Well, I wouldn't have you anywhere else doing it. So thank you for coming here. And Pleasure. Fred's, you, you, yes, you listening at home. Thank you for joining us tonight um, because we love this stuff and hopefully you do too. And if you're watching, I bet you do. Um, if you have any requests for future episodes, Cast Dice and the Warlord Games podcast are back. I am back. We are back. Everything's back. Please message the page, Cast Dice on Facebook. C-A-S-T-D-I-C-E. -E. If you message the page, you are guaranteed a response by me. It is going to happen. Just remember, I live in Australia and sometimes I sleep. So it might take a couple hours, but you are guaranteed a response because as Robin said, there is absolutely, there's nothing worse than messaging someone and not getting a reply. Absolutely. You are guaranteed one at Cast Dice. And really, friends, thank you for joining us today. This has just been such a joy to record. And um, I look forward to having the show back in full swing soon. Uh, please do, um, yeah, immediately go out and get this book because Talking <laughs> Miniatures is like everything I've wanted for Christmas for years. Um, short of the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier, but that's a story for another day. Uh, that's a different story. Yeah. Hmm. But on that note, what our buddy Casey always says is when you are playing the games that we know and love, I hope that your dice roll hot. I hope that your beverages are cold. But more than that, we at Cast Dice hope that you are having fun. Stay safe out there, guys. Good night.